I'm here with Harry Peck. He was a World War II pilot on the Hellcat. Can you tell us a little about it, how it was to fly the Hellcat? The Hellcat was a terrific airplane, and uh, its characteristics was a real jump from flying Wildcats. I flew Wildcats in the early part of the war. I was in a Wildcat squadron, and all of a sudden I was transferred to Butch O'Hare squadron, BF-3, and we flew Hellcats. Now Hellcat was a tremendous airplane. It had a wide landing gear, which uh, you couldn't ground loop it like you could a Wildcat. It would go to a real high altitude. I can remember taking some to almost 35,000 feet, and uh, it would dogfight with anything. And it had a long range, and it was a comfortable airplane to fly. And uh, I had joined the Navy in the summer of 1941, before the war started. And when the war day the war started, I had been sent home. I was on leave, getting ready to join a squadron that was going over into the South Pacific on the West Coast. And this was the 6th of December, 1941. And the family and the neighbors had all gathered to uh, say goodbye to me. And exactly 2 o'clock, we were listening to the Chicago Bears, Washington Redskins football game. And this was one of the old radios with a big speaker and vacuum tubes. And my brother and I thought we'd blow the vacuum tube. We jumped up. They were all wet. The next second, the radio came back on. And this, remember, it's 2 o'clock Chicago time, 7 o'clock Honolulu time. They said the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. All military personnel report back to base immediately. So back to base we went, and from there I went to my operational squadron to the South Pacific. And that's when I was then sent to Butch O'Hare squadron and flew with him for a while. And all of a sudden we got orders again. And we were very disappointed because we we're going into a uh, squadron that we thought had old wildcats again. So I reported in, and <laughs> here it was a uh, FM2, which was a souped-up wildcat. The old wildcat used to have a uh, 950 horsepower engine. They had changed, had streamlined it, flush river did it, and it had a 1450 horsepower Opel blade engine. And it would dogfight right with a zero because I had quite a few dogfights with the fly the FM2. But anyway, uh, after flying the FM2, our squadron then went back over to the South Pacific and we were engaged in the Marshall Islands. And in the Marshall Islands, I had flown some uh, cap missions and they were getting ready to uh, land the troops. So, uh, and this day, it was in February, I believe it was February of uh, 44. Uh, I was leading a flight of the carrier, a flight of four, and I was number one in the carrier. And we had we lost some airplanes, some guys, and we had airplanes stored on Majero. And we picked up one of the airplanes the night before, one of the guys had been ferried in, pick up the airplane, Bob Minnie. And he said on takeoff, he almost ground looped. Something was wrong with his left wheel. So that night, the mechs jacked it up, spun the wheel, nothing wrong with it. So I, that was the airplane I had number one on the deck that morning. So I uh, got ready to take off, and I was in the full power mode and started down the deck. We had three carriers, and we're taking off at 10-second intervals. And I was in the third carrier, so I watched the guy in the carrier next to me going down the deck. And all of a sudden, he turned 90 degrees, crashed in the catwalk, and blew up. And I thought, oh my gosh, that poor guy. 
and I started down the deck and at full power and all of a sudden I started pulling to the left. Well, I immediately made sure I had full right rudder and I hit my right brake to try to arrest my turn to the left and I, I did partially and I immediately hit my water injection. Now water injection was for an emergency. <laughs> And my manifold pressure, I remember out of my eye, it jumped from 49 inches to 59 inches. <laughs> and my airplane picked up uh, some lift. And just as I got to the edge of the deck, I yanked the stick up, back, jumped the catwalk, settled down, picked up my flying speed, turned to my strafing heading, pulled up my flaps, and started climbing up at 125 knots. Now, as I'm climbing up, my wingman, old J.T. Milne, caught up with me. And about 500 feet, he said, all of a sudden, the belts of smoke came out of the front of my airplane. My prop stopped. And in the old Wildcat, the FM-2, he had to wind the wheels up 28 turns. So you developed a pretty good right arm. <laughs> and I remember I counted 16. And that was the last I remember. Because JT said, all of a sudden, my airplane stopped in midair, flipped over from about 500 Street, and went straight in. Well, when I hit, I got knocked out. My shoulder harness broke, my head hit the gun sight, and I'm out. Now, in the meantime, old JT made two circles over me. And, it, and he timed it, he took about four minutes. And I hadn't come to the surface. He called in and said, no survivor. In the meantime, <laughs> I came to underwater. And that was pretty dark around me, like when you're scuba diving. And I could see bubbles going up and a little light in the surface. And what had saved my life, that morning I put my oxygen mask, which had two positions, diluted demand, 100% oxygen. I flipped it to 100% oxygen because I thought we might have to climb the altitude after any airplanes. And I didn't want to catch the bends. So when I came to, here's my broken shoulder harnesses floating in front of me. I said a prayer and I said, God, how do I get out of this mess? And he immediately, <laughs> I immediately remembered everything. We used to practice getting out of oh, airplanes out of the water. So, hey, unhook all your gear. So I unhooked my old oh, radio earphones, but I left my oxygen mask hooked up to the very last, but I left it on. So I reached in, I grabbed my life raft and started to push off my darn life raft would come along. Uh, away from my parachute, so I grabbed everything and started swimming to the surface. And it seemed like I took an eternity. And I finally broke surface. In the meantime, JT had gone and moved on then to a strafing mission. He turned around and he came back. He said it was about almost eight minutes. And just as he came back, I broke the surface. And he <laughs> it was a good time. And he called in and said, I don't know how he did it, <laughs> but he's alive. <laughs> now, eight minutes underwater, <laughs> you wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been alive if I hadn't had 100% oxygen, my oxygen mask. So anyway, I got my uh, life raft out. And I said, oh, I better tie it to my uh, oh, uh, May West. We used to call our oh, uh, life jackets Mae West. Uh, you should know why. <laughs> and so I got a, rope, a line and tied uh, to my life raft and then inflated it because I knew if it ever started blowing away from me, I could never catch it swimming. So I held on the side and went to climb in. All of a sudden, I realized I'm exhausted. I can't. And I looked down and I said, oh, you idiot. <laughs> you forgot to inflate your May West. <laughs> so I inflated my May West and floated for a while, got my strength back. Crawled in the life raft. And I sort of, uh, I guess I went into shock a little bit. I don't, but anyway, I, I was laying down the battle, 
about my life raft, and I came back and I looked down, <laughs> it was full of blood. <laughs> I said, boy, what's going on? I can't see out of my right eye. So I got my signal mirror out, looked to see what was going on, and <laughs> it was a mess. So I got my first aid kit out, bandaged the right side of my head, and then sat down and said, okay, now what am I going to do? So I uh, said, hey, I better tie all my gear in the life raft so I don't lose it. So I did. And then I said, okay, we all had maps those days. So I knew I was southeast of the Marshall Islands. I had my parachute. So I said, hey, <laughs> I could sail into the Marshall Islands. <laughs> I, I hope they've taken it by the time I get there. So uh, I sat back down and I relaxed a while. I guess I was in and out of it for a while. But all of a sudden, I looked at my watch and I'd taken off uh, about 4.30. And it was about 8 or 9 o'clock. I said, man, <laughs> I wonder <laughs> how long I'm going to be here. And about 10 o'clock, I looked at my watch again. And there was a little speck on the horizon. I realized it was a destroyer. And just about that time, they had a lookout up in the uh, oh, uh, crow's nest. Uh, the destroyer was a 606 USS Coughlin. I'll never forget. Just about that time, a wave came along. I'm sitting up on top of this wave just as the lookout put his field glasses over, and there I am. So the destroyer came sailing over. The guy put it in full reverse. They threw me a line. They wanted to pull me into the destroyer. Well, I think I was still punchy because I immediately tied the line to all my, my life raft, all my gear, jumped off the life raft, <laughs> swam over the side of the destroyer, and they had a cargo net over the side. So I climbed up the cargo net, stepped over the gunnel, <laughs> and there's a couple of guys standing there, and I'm all covered with blood. <laughs> and they reached out to grab me, to, said, hey, I'm okay, guys. <laughs> I passed out. Next thing I do, came to about 2 o'clock. I'm in the old wardroom. And uh, they used to use the wardroom as the operating table. <laughs> Man, I, I guess, uh, oh, it was around 10 o'clock. I beg your pardon, around 10 or 10.30. And uh, anyway, <laughs> I looked up, and the doctor, I was very fortunate. The doctor was on the cogla this day because a flotilla of four destroyers had one doctor, and they, the different days there are different destroyers. And the Almighty was looking over me again. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And so, uh, anyway, <laughs> I looked up, and the, the doctor's name was Dr. McGuire from Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> he looked down at me, and I, I'm, I'm just a young guy. I mean, let's see, uh, I was born in 21, so, uh, and this is... Uh, so anyway, he looked down and he says, son, uh, how does it feel? <laughs> I said, it hurts like blank. <laughs> and he says, if I give you any more morphine, uh, you're going to swallow pretty much. You'll have some bad scars. And I said, oh, forget it. And he handed me a little jig of brandy, <laughs> went down, came up. And the next thing I remember, I woke up. I'm in the captain's cabin, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I uh, saw all my gear. They cleaned it up, hanging up, so I got up, and, uh, oh, uh, I, under I, I understand today you have a photo of when you were in the service. Yes, sir. Uh, they transferred me from the uh, destroyer back to our carrier, and coming aboard the carrier, I have photos <laughs> coming across to the mailbag, and they used to uh, transfer people in mailbags. And I'll never forget, the old chief climbed up where I got into the mailbag, and he says, son, don't look down. Stay down in that, uh, stay down. So I did. So I did, I stood up, I looked down. <laughs> I'm about 50 feet above the churning water between the destroyer and the carrier. <laughs> and that scared me about it as much as anything. Guys <laughs> sat right back down and waited till they got aboard the carrier on the uh, old flight deck on the not flight deck but the Hager deck. And they put and I got out and the sponsor and they took a picture of me with a, my head bandaged up with a skipper and exec. 
Perry, what was it like to be on the ship after the life raft? I just thank God. <laughs> that was a challenge to me. And uh, our the chief surgeon, uh, or oh, Commander Newman, who later on became um, Admiral Newman, head of Bumed surgery, uh, was a specialist, a uh, retina specialist. But he took one look at me, and he says, uh, I don't have proper equipment, but the USS Relief hospital ship is about 20 miles away. We're going to transfer you tomorrow morning. And uh, they, uh, the, they had pulled glass out of my eyes, and they had one big chunk right next to my iris they'd pulled out. So anyway, next morning I was transferred to the relief, <clears throat> and they hadn't quite started the invasion of the marshals yet. So <laughs> there were only about three or four naval aviators who had gotten hurt, <laughs> besides myself, <laughs> on the hospital ship with about five or six hundred nurses and a couple hundred doctors. <laughs> we're in their glory. <laughs> Sounds like you got the best of care. Yeah, oh, we did. And so anyway, they took a look at it and worked on my eyes, bandaged it up again. And so uh, the next morning, they started the invasion. So I was ambulatory, so I, as they brought wounded aboard, they were only wounded for maybe 30, 40 minutes or less, so they're on the modern hospital ship in the modern hospital room. And since it was ambulatory, I was helping the nurses. And I ran into a guy that uh, had been at that too when our outfit had been up there and we lost a couple pilots. But anyway, a couple of days later, they pulled the bandage off my head. And before they did it, the doctor said, now look, son, don't be disappointed if you can't see. I thought, oh no, there goes my flying career. They pulled the bandage off my head. <laughs> I could see better than 2020. All right. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> was I happy. So uh, the next day they pretty well filled up with casualties and they said, okay, uh, we're gonna go home. You, you'll be going home on survivor's leave. I said, the heck I will. I wanna go back to my squadron. <laughs> the guy looked, he said, what do you mean? I said, I won't go home. I want to go back to my squadron. So they um, called the command ship, and uh, they used to call him the oh, Admiral's Holly Mad Smith, they would call him. He was in charge of the invasion. They said, we've got a crazy naval aviator here who wants to go back to a squadron. He said, send him over. We need aviators. So I went to the command ship. And something real fun happened. Dana Graham, dad, <laughs> was on the command ship. <laughs> and of course, people around here know Dana. So anyway, I went aboard the command ship. And I was rooming with a bunch of Marines. And they said, hey, we're going ashore behind enemy lines tomorrow. You want to go with us? <laughs> I said, oh, heck yes. And uh, I might tell you, my dad was an FBI agent. He taught me how to shoot, <laughs> and I could shoot pretty well. <laughs> and so, <laughs> anyway, I checked out a carbine. I had the 45 my dad had for World War I. I got a hard hat. They says, we're leaving a little after three before four. so we get there before dark? Oh, it's still dark. So uh, I got there real early to get in the whale boat. And about that time, on the blowhorn comes Lieutenant Junior Great Peck, report to the executive officer immediately. <laughs> I thought, oh no. I ran up, stood the tension before him, Carmen over my shoulder, I said, sir, I had permission from the Admiral. He said, that's been canceled. Your carrier's on the way in to pick you up. <laughs> so <laughs> that afternoon, the, the old Manila Bay came in, picked me up, then went back to fly combat in the South Pacific for another uh, eight months. I put in 43 missions. I had a combat with uh, a Jap Tony, which is the uh, Japanese version of the ME-109. I came home, he didn't. And uh, later on, I had something happen that uh, we were flying combat air patrol over the battleships that were shelling uh, oh, uh, Japanese fortifications uh, on New Britain and New Ireland. 
the islands in northern Solomons. And all of a sudden, oh, uh, I got a call, <laughs> bogey, bogey. And they sent me out, and that's when I got the uh, Tony. A couple days later, bogey, bogey. They gave me a vector to go get him. <laughs> so I went out. All of a sudden, he was in the cloud. Out of the cloud he came, and I'd sent my wingman up above. So if he came out above, my wingman had him, below I had him. And he was a Lockheed Lodestar. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's an Army Air Corps airplane. So I pulled over and I got the number off of him. And I called it in. The guy says, check him out better. So I said, okay. So I pulled up and got right above the cockpit. And I looked down and I said, whoa. <laughs> They're not Americans. Two Japs. And this was a airplane they'd captured at the start of the war. Well, hey, I pulled back and I immediately looked at the guns. <laughs> I was waiting for it to start swiveling at me. And I started to pull up and I looked in the back and they opened up the big doors in the back. And I took a second look and I couldn't believe it. Two Americans with the most horrible look on your face they thought they were going to be dead. I couldn't believe it. They were leaning out the back door, and I suddenly realized they had American prisoners in the back. I pulled up real fast, got out of the gun range. I called in, and I said, my God, what do I do? I don't want to shoot these guys down. They got Americans. And it seemed like an eternity, but it was only a few seconds. <laughs> Oh, and Mullen next to me came in. She says, Harry, let the black, black guys go. <laughs> so I let them go. You had quite a few amazing experiences. Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for your service, Harry. <laughs> <laughs>